I think we are now live. Um, we are very happy to be here. Bienvenue, bienvenidas y bienvenidos. Welcome. Uh, I'm Julia Emanuel Marsan, the Director for Strategy and Partnership of AREA. We are a partner of eTrade for All, and we are very, very happy to co organize with UNCTAD uh, this session uh, today. We are going to discuss about uh, uh, digital entrepreneurship and female entrepreneurs and how this can boost inclusion, something that is very important for the eTrade for All partnership and actually uh, the overall discussion of the e commerce week uh, 2020. I'm also particularly happy because we are going to have a truly global conversation with entrepreneurs from Asia, Latin America, and Africa. Uh, and before we start the conversation today, uh, please feel free to interact with us. We have a chat box. Feel free to leave us comments and ideas as we will get back to uh, your questions during the Q&A segment uh, of, uh, of the session later, later today. Um, but before we start our panel discussion, uh, I will introduce our amazing panelists. But now it's time to give the floor to uh, Viridiana Garcia uh, Quiles from UNCTAD, who will uh, share with us some introductory remarks. Over to you, Viridiana. Thanks a lot, Julia. And uh, I also would like to welcome uh, our participants and our speakers today. I'm really um, delighted to be here and, uh, and also um, looking forward to, to hearing from the, the different experience that our speakers will share with us today from all corners uh, of the globe. And I think we will have a very rich and uh, engaging discussion. Um, so my name is Viridiana and I work at UNCTAD. I am part of what we call the E-Trade for Women initiative. Um, this is a program that supports women entrepreneurs in the digital economy. Um, and you will, you will hear some of our members, uh, some of the women entrepreneurs we work with uh, shortly in, during the session. But today I would like to maybe help a bit set the scene of the conversation um, by highlighting three key elements that uh, have also been touched upon in different sessions of the e-commerce week and try to summarize some of the, the key elements that, uh, that are important to consider when we talk about digital entrepreneurship and how to boost the inclusion of women in, in this space. So the first point I would like to highlight is the need to increase the participation of women entrepreneurs in the digital space. The second point is how, what are some avenues, some options that we can consider for that to boost women inclusion. Um, and also the third point will be to share a bit of hope. Uh, we have reasons to be optimistic about what is happening and we will hear more during the session. But first, let me highlight that it is, it is quite urgent to address the fact that women are not participating as much as men in the digital economy. And this is true for women entrepreneurs. We know that the digital transformation is opening many opportunities for SMEs in the digital space. We have new business models. Um, SMEs can access market more easily, information that can be part of, of the regional and global value chains more, more, in a more effective way, thanks to digital tools. And we also know that helping digital SMEs grow and scale and be successful is very important for development, economic development, because in turn, they can create jobs, they can create livelihoods. So this is really a key topic and it is at the heart of UNCTAD's work uh, in the digital economy. Yet what we, what we know as well, and this is something we have heard throughout the, the e-commerce week and all the other sessions is that there is a digital divide and men and women entrepreneurs are not equipped um, similarly, to engage and succeed in the digital economy and capture some of the gains. The digital ecosystem, and, and here I'm taking aside the big players, the big digital platforms. I'm talking about digital SMEs, which actually um, represent most of the companies and the businesses active in the digital space. They are small, they are locally anchored or nationally anchored, but most of these are run by men and women are still lagging behind. This is reflected in the low numbers of women in leadership positions. In, this is true across all sectors, but of course, it's even uh, more acute uh, in the digital space. Just a quick figure that I found interesting is that if we look at across sectors, um, the number of women in leadership positions, we see that only 30% of senior management positions are held by women. And here I'm talking about the European Union, which is supposed to be, in general, a bit more advanced in terms of gender equality. So 30%. This is not much. 
And uh, uh, if we look a bit at the, the entrepreneurial um, uh, mindset, um, according to the OECD, men on average are 1.7 times more likely than women uh, to be self-employed, meaning that they have started in their own business. So we see already a difference. And now if we focus on the startups, the digital startups, the innovative startups, we see that 90% of these startups, which are sinking um, venture capital, so investment, 90% of them have been founded by men. So this gap is huge and um, it will increase if we don't address these issues. And even if we know that women can have access to the digital skills they need, there is another type of barrier that comes into play, which are social and cultural barriers. So to close it, get this gap, we need to enable more women to become active players in the digital economy. And I'm really looking forward to hear some of them today. We need them to be not just users or consumers. We need more women as entrepreneurs, as sellers, as innovators. And in turn, they will also have a chance to generate wealth, to be active uh, economic agents and transform with a transformative power. So I don't want to be too long, but I wanted to touch upon three or four areas of action that uh, we have been considering within UNCTAD and within the overall E-Trade for All uh, partnership. Let me go very quickly through these. So first, we need to boost digital skills. Um, we need more girls, young girls to engage uh, into STEM, so science and technology fields. Um, this will not only equip them with the right skills, but also with the confidence that they can try and they can themselves become actors in this field. We also need to promote more women as role models. And this is something we do within e for Women. Um, we need women who have succeeded in the digital space as entrepreneurs, as founders, co-founders of digital companies, e-commerce companies, to show the way, to show to other women, younger women who may be considering to do it, that it is possible, it is within reach. It's very hard when you don't have an example of somebody similar to you, it's really hard to imagine that you can do it. So this is something that is also important to break um, the, the social and cultural barriers that women still face today. Third, and this is probably more related to uh, the work that uh, UNCTAD and the United Nations does, is that we need to shape more enabling and environments for digital businesses, not just for women-led businesses, but for all digital businesses, because a business alone, a small or a medium-sized business alone cannot do it all um, as a standalone uh, actor. Um, to scale, to grow, you need to rely on a supportive environment. And here I'm talking, of course, about connectivity, affordable, reliable connectivity, but also about e-payment system, a regulatory environment that allows for small businesses to grow, to seek capital, to trade across borders, et cetera. So it's the overall ecosystem that needs to be more supportive of digital businesses. And the last element I wanted to mention is that we also need, if we really want to change policies and make them more responsive to women's needs and digital businesses needs, we need to listen to the actors of the digital ecosystems. And for that, we need more women to engage and enter into a dialogue with policymakers. Um, we need to pay attention to what they need, understand what they need, um, and, and this will help um, identify the best responses, the more effective responses. This is also something that we do at, uh, at ETRIC for Women. So just a very quick um, comment I wanted to make, and this will be my last point. I, I believe that there is reason for hope. There is really reason to believe that um, women are already uh, changing uh, the digital ecosystem. They're really, some of them are, have already founded very uh, successful and excited, exciting e-commerce businesses and digital companies. And at E-Trade for Women, um, we work with some of these women. So E-Trade for Women is a, a program that supports um, women all across the world, especially in developing countries, who have started their own e-commerce of digital or digital business. And um, we support, we provide um, these entrepreneurs more visibility, we connect them to a larger network. Um, and what we also do is try to give them a more um, audible voice in the, in the policy and digital ecosystem. 
But what we have done also is to support a few very successful outstanding women digital entrepreneurs who come and are, are advocates and they share a, a powerful message that women can succeed in the digital economy, um, that it is possible to uh, break down barriers. Um, and that there is a lot uh, to be done still in that space. If I have one minute, but Julia, let me know. I would like to share one example, the example of one advocate. Is that okay? Sure, quickly. Okay. I'll be very quick. <laughs> so I wanted to share one example, and maybe some of you had the chance to, to hear about Mona, and she was just now uh, doing one session in conversation with during the, this e-week. So let me share her story. So Mona, Mona Ataya, uh, she's the advocate of uh, E-Trade for Women for the Arab region. She's Palestinian, she was raised in Lebanon and she found in Mum's World, it's an e-commerce pla e platform that sells everything for mother and children. She started it in Dubai, in the UAE in 2011. And at the time, very few people believed uh, in, in internet-based businesses in that region. The ecosystem was not ready. Nobody wanted to lend her money. Uh, everybody thought that she was really going in the right, wrong direction. But her journey was one of persistence. And today, Mom's World is the largest funded woman-led tech business in the Arab region. It's extremely successful. Um, and herself, Mona, she has also been promoting women empowerment uh, throughout her activities. Um, and she's extremely successful, both as an entrepreneur and as a role model. So her example shows us that the digital economy should not be just a male space. Uh, it shows us that that space also has something to offer to women, even in the least expected uh, regions of the world. Um, and it also shows us that women can be very successful drivers of growth and sustainable development. So I hope we hear more from other examples today, other women, other regions, um, and I wish you all a, a, an interesting discussion. Thank you very Diana. I think you will hear many more stories. Thank you also for this very comprehensive introduction that is actually showing us the complexities of these issues. And I think we are going to touch upon many of these issues with our panelists, which is definitely the time to introduce right now. Right now. We're very lucky to have with us today, Amy Ramley. She's the Director of Digital Innovation and Growth at Time Solutions, which is an award-winning tech consultancy specializing in bridging gaps in organization. And she's also many other things, such as the co-chair of the US ASEAN Women's Leadership Academy Alumni Network, and also an Obama Foundation leader. Thank you, Amy, for being with us. Also with us today, uh, Birami Sok, the founder of Quelai in Dakar, Senegal, but also Miami, Florida, if I understand correctly. Uh, this is a newly developed B2B wholesale sourcing marketplace for products made in Africa. And Birami has 20 years of experience uh, as a technologist, entrepreneur, and high-level executive with a key focus on digital media. Thank you very much, Birami, for being with us today. We also have on the panel uh, Claudia Rosales, the founder and CEO of Women eWork uh, from in Lima, based in Lima, Peru, in Latin America. This is an organization that aims at generating a social impact in Latin America by contributing to fostering more gender equality in leadership positions. And also Claudia has a lot of experiences in human resources and she has worked in more than nine countries and you will hear more from her very soon. Thank you so much, Claudia. And uh, uh, finally, uh, also with us, uh, uh, I'm not sure we can see her because she has having some glitches with the camera, but definitely with us on the panel, Purnima Jayawardana, uh, she's a financial sector specialist from the Asian Development Bank, and she's currently the financial inclusion lead for Indonesia. Uh, because we have so much to discuss, let's, uh, uh, kick, uh, uh, let's uh, kick start the first round of questions. And uh, I would like to start to ask to Amy. You are an entrepreneur working on women's economic development and also the digital transformation. And I would like to uh, understand from you a little bit what happened, uh, especially over the last two years uh, during the pandemic. So how uh, do you think uh, uh, the evolution of uh, women's role uh, has impacted uh, the digital economy in Southeast Asia? Over to you, Amy. Well, thank you so much, Julian. Thank you for having me. Um, I think 
Southeast Asia, as you all would know, is really diverse and complex region. And so there are variations in terms of what the pandemic has done in terms of impact to women's place in the digital economy. And I remember attending a, a talk recently and how I think it was in, in, in Indonesia, there are actually more startups started by women in the past couple of years than ever before because of, of a variety of reasons. And I think there was a lot of investment in trying to improve digital uh, economies. but saying that countries like Brunei, where I'm from, um, and other parts like Laos, uh, uh, Cambodia, um, the limitations in terms of the, the ecosystem and the infrastructure in place, like digital payments across borders, we can't use PayPal, for example, um, really limits the growth and scale of a lot of these um, initiatives. And I think um, the the impact of lack of tourism over the past few years has a huge impact on um, a lot of the industries in those countries as well. And so you will see a mixed bag of results. However, the the push towards digitization by a lot of these countries is really um, accelerated the the digital transformation and I, I can tell you about that about in Brunei within the past two years we've made uh, larger strides than we've had in the past 10 years when it comes to digitization and that means that a lot more opportunities are there for women uh, to be able to to jump in and, and create their own businesses online um, on the flip side, uh, women are taking on more care care work, um, informal work that's really hampering their ability to participate. And I think Southeast Asia, and I think maybe some other parts of the world where we don't have ready access to things like PayPal or Shopify or a lot of these ready-made platforms that enables um, economic or e-commerce e easily for a lot of people, um, the barrier to entry is a lot higher. And this really, uh, changes the balance in terms of, of equality of access, where men who have more connections to people with technical backgrounds might find it easier to start their online businesses, whereas women might not feel as easily um, able to be able to jump in and, and create an online business for even if they already have a, a traditional business model. So um, to sum up, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated story, but there's positive growth and we see pockets of growth. And this has resulted in a lot more um, role models um, that we can see across the region. And I think more importantly than, than just young girls being able to see other women being able to successfully do this, governments seeing there are a lot more women in successful roles in, in businesses and really contributing to the economy um, are paying attention and really leveraging some of their policies to, to enable more women to do this. And so seeing that positive example not only has ramifications for girls trying to get into the sector, but also for governments designing their policies to enable more of this because they see the benefits. Um, so I hope that doesn't overly complicate the picture, but gives a sense of hope despite um, the, the complexities of the region. Thank you, Amy. And I can confirm that uh, thanks to the pandemic and this acceleration of the digital economy, even regionally in Southeast Asia, policy makers are really paying much more attention to the issue of the digital gender divide and uh, women digital entrepreneurship. But now let's move on to another region and let's go virtually to Africa with Birami. You have founded and led multiple startups in both advanced economies and developing markets. So based on your experience, how have digital businesses and especially, especially women-led SMEs contributed to promote more inclusive economic development. And perhaps, can you give us a few examples from Africa? Over to you, Birame. Thank you, and thank you to Untad and uh, Aria for organizing this, uh, this event and giving us the opportunity to participate in this conversation. Um, so uh, yes, so I am actually currently in Dakar after being in the US for over 26 years. and. Um, I, my, I started my career as a programmer, so have, have always been part of sort of this digital world and had an opportunity to see um, the beginning of a sector within the digital world. Actually, even um, starting as a programmer, this is going to date me, it was when we first started building websites um, for businesses. Uh, it was being used more in very specific environments. And then having the opportunity to start my first startup when we were first starting to build applications on the mobile phone, which was again, another sort of side of the, the digital um, space. 
Um, having moved here, I, I moved here actually here in Senegal, Dakar, with the intention to start a digital company with the idea that we could build a B2B e-commerce platform um, to be able to highlight uh, made in Africa products uh, and, and make sure that these products can be present and visible on the shelves of international um, companies, stores, et cetera. What I found out very quickly is that in Africa, you don't, you cannot, and, and, and much so in Senegal, most specifically in Senegal, you can't just focus on having a digital company um, because what you find out very quickly is as an entrepreneur in, in Africa, we're having to um, not just build, we're not building a startup, we're building an ecosystem. And that, and so we, we've realized we had to be able to work on the packaging, on, um, you know, on, on logistics, on actually the filling, the labeling. And so the, the business has turned into all these different pieces. So I just wanted to already give that picture, which is to say that the, the, the environment is very different when we talk about Africa and we talk about um, uh, some of the more I don't want to say advanced economies because they're more maybe more digitally advanced um, economies. Um, but then when we talk about being a female entrepreneur uh, in the in the digital space, uh, I was the only woman in my class when we when I was taking programming a class a lessons. I was usually the only woman programmer in the companies that I've worked for, and I was one of the few female. Um, entrepreneurs that was really moving on the on the digital side, and and I think one of the things to me having that digital background was very helpful um, because I didn't have to depend on anyone. I could just be able to translate my ideas directly into um, into an app if I had to or a demo. Um, I think the difficulty, and this doesn't just apply to women. I think the difficulty is that we have this assumption that you have to have some technology background to have a digital um, company. But I think it's more a question of having access to resources. Um, may there be human resources that can help develop the application, but it can also be having access to resources such as, um, I think it was Amy that mentioned it, um, having access to, uh, other tools that are in the digital space to be able to build what we're looking to build. Um, and and, and as, as, as women, I think this, I, I don't have the data in front of me, but I, I've sat through enough reports around it. We, we tend to, to only try to get into what we believe we can handle. Um, not necessarily what the company can handle, but what we as a woman can handle. And so if we don't have that technology background or that digital knowledge, we try tend to shy away from it and not necessarily touch it when, um, you know, some of the data will show that men will will jump into it even if they don't know what it's about, will claim that they know everything about it even if they're going to learn along the way. And so I think there's already that difference that, that creates some of that gap. But also the fact that um, when we look at Africa specifically, the digital space is just starting really to pick up in its own way. But I always say it's thanks to Africa really that we use voice messages so much through, through WhatsApp because it was resolving a particular issue. I watch my mom and I watch other older women that are using their phones to communicate, to place orders. All that to me is e-commerce. They're just doing it very differently. It's not a single platform that they can go to on a PC to be able to click buy, but they're doing it all in their own way using digital tools. So I think we're getting there, but there's still some work to be done in terms of, yes, getting more girls um, to study STEMs, um, but also just this demystifying the digital space, uh, not making it seem like if you are not a geek, you cannot do anything in the digital space. That if you don't, um, if it's not a full app that you built yourself, that you cannot have a digital company. But I think we're getting a lot more examples now of women jumping into the space and, and proving themselves to be more than capable to be part of this whole digital economy. I hope that answers the question, but... Uh, Absolutely. 
<laughs> thank you very much, Pirani. And what you said is is very important. I mean, you can be a geek also in a very feminine way. I mean, there's no one model fitting everybody, and this is very important also for policymakers and whoever is supporting women entrepreneurs in the digital economy to remember there, are, there is a, really a lot of diversity of models and of ecosystems, relationships, as you were just touching upon before. But now let's move again to another region. Let's cross virtually the Atlantic and move uh, on with Claudia in Latin America. Um, so. Claudia, uh, women have a lot to bring to the table. We, we have heard it clearly from Viridiana at the beginning. But as also Viridiana mentioned, uh, they often suffer from biases and stereotypes uh, that are actually holding them back. So can you tell us more about how your organization, Women eWork, contributes to narrow the gender gap observed in leadership position in Peru and more in general in Latin America? Uh, over to you, Claudia. Thank you. Thank you, Julia, for having me today and for this opportunity to share my experience in this conversation. I'm the founder of Women in Work, a company that is dedicated to providing nature services with a focus on gender equality. I started my company in the pandemic because it was the moment in which more women lost their jobs in Peru and in Latin America and in globally. I have been working 25 years in HR in a large companies, and I live in five different countries in Latin America, Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, and now in Peru. And the gender equality issues are the same in Latin America. So I decided to help in the pandemic moment, women to recover the jobs through tools that we have used in the HR areas thousands of times and prove it right. So I gather uh, 12 women that are HR experts to help me in that challenge. In Latin America, you have to know that it's not always easy to take a position from within the companies about gender equality topics. There are a lot of traditional companies that associate gender equality with potential internal conflict. So we believe, and we believe that gender equality must be a conversation into the top executive team table inside of the company and that HR leaders can start this discussion with the top leaders. But most of the time it doesn't happen. Uh, the time in this moment is crucial because the private sector is the largest employer in every country in Latin America. In creating consciousness, we think that we can lead to open doors for more women to return to the labor sector. We, as I told you before, are HR experts, and we also are advocates of equality and women empowerment. We deliver trainings in companies and university to HR, especially to HR teams and to leadership teams regarding to the advantages and contribution of the women in organization. We are 12 women located in eight countries in Latin America with a significant amount of experience, 15, 18, 20, and 25 years doing uh, working in HR in the region. And we want to use all of the weight of our years of experience to introduce equality, gender equality, um, conversation, raising the case about how women create value for the companies and how we have seen in first, uh, in first person the increase of rentability when companies invest in empowering, empowering them. So uh, our contribution is from the private sector perspective, from the decades of HR experience, uh, it gives us a truthful, it's allow us to be a truthful advisor for HR teams in the companies that are just starting to convert to have the conversation of gender equality. So we want to help them. We want to make them feel comfortable because this is, this is one of the challenges. People from HR want to uh, lead the conversation, but they have uh, two problems and conflicts with the leadership team. So we want to advise them how to start this conversation in a good way. Since our foundation, we have focused on the benefits of how gender equality supports rentability. We delivering tools such as women leadership trainings, workshop to prevent bias 
offering a headhunting with gender equality focus. We are the first headhunting in Peru and in several countries that only focus on gender equality. And we help lead HR leaders regarding to how to introduce gender equality, equality initiatives in the company, little by little, step by step. Probably this is why we achieve a rapidly growing community in a, from HR, of HR people who listen to us and ask us uh, how we can support them. We made a commitment to make a social impact since we know that in a that women have a fewer opportunities and more challenges to grow to leadership position and in the pandemic, the situation get worse. Therefore, our bet has been to raise the discussion in positive terms, because in Latin America, we cannot, we should not go to the direct uh, to generate a consciousness for a change. There's a lot of challenges. To, to have this conversation. So we are committed to closing the gender gap through giving tools that we prove in the past that are critical for leadership development. And that we have implemented years and years to successful development leaders, most of the time male leaders in the large corporation. We strive to be a company that wants to democratize access to these support services for the economic empowerment of women by helping them to find employment, to preparing them to look for a promotion, to ensuring through equality headhunting that we create a talent pool in which the priority are women. With our trainings, we prevent bias and stereotypes and we, impact, we can impact behaviors and mindsets, influencing leaders' attitudes toward gender equality. And these are an important part of our advocacy strategy. And we are very happy to do that. Um, in the headhunting division, we're looking for women to hire, encourage women to apply in a STEM position, for example. And we are the only headhunter that openly ask for women uh, when we post a job offers. Uh, we want to, to be a digital platform of choice that helps women in the critical moments when they lost their jobs and want to return from a leave, when they want to change their career paths. When they need a support services, we want to be a click away from being able to have any Latin American women in any country to re-enter her, her, her career or returning to her jobs. To empower, we want to empower them and grow their leadership abilities and capabilities and contribute at the end to recover their own economy. Thank you, Claudia, for this overview view of uh, your initiatives again I mean the issue of skills uh, I think everybody will touch the touch upon it because it's so crucial uh, now let's continue and uh, let's conclude this uh, first round with Purnima uh, again we won't be able to see her unfortunately but at least we can see your picture um, so ADB the Asian Development Bank uh, is very committed to contribute to the sustainable development agenda 2030 in, together with uh, and consistently with the UN objectives, uh, prosperous, prosperous, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable Asia and the Pacific uh, by, as I was saying, 2030. So can you tell us more about the main strategies and programs that uh, uh, ADB is implementing to advance women participation in the digital economy? Uh, over to you, Purnima. Uh, thanks, Julia, and also for the opportunity to join this uh, discussion today. Um, so for ADB, uh, accelerating progress in gender equality and promoting women's empowerment is core to our mandate. And it is one of the seven operational priorities in our current strategy 2030. And the strategy 2030 has also identified promoting innovative technology as one of the guiding uh, principles for ADB's operations and also underscores a commitment to support countries in developing policies and improving the regulatory environment for digital economy. So uh, over the past several decades, um, ADB has integrated gender equality across our operations, technical assistance, and also knowledge work. So whether it's water and sanitation projects or building roads and other infrastructure or financial inclusion, 
ADB has been ensuring that women and girls can equitably benefit from our wide range of investments across Asia and the Pacific region. Um, indeed, by uh, 2030, ADB has committed that 75% of our operations will promote gender equality. And this is the target that we are close to uh, meeting already in 2022. Um, ensuring that women can participate in and benefit from the digital economy is critical. And in Asia and the Pacific, the digital transformation of our economies have actually put at risk women's jobs, uh, which tend to be concentrated in lower skilled occupations. Uh, Pre-pandemic female labor force participation was declining in the Asia-Pacific region. And this decline has been further accelerated by the pandemic, which has seen more women's jobs lost in the region uh, as well as globally. So creating decent work opportunities for women in the digital economy will be critical and central to building back better and as an important focus of ADB's operations in the current pandemic uh, recovery context. So um, if I may just um, highlight some of our main strategies and also approaches to advance women's participation in the digital economy. Uh, ADB has been focusing on building digital skills of women. Uh, for example, ADB's Women's Finance Exchange is a platform that aims to support financial institutions to build digital financial skills of female clients and provide them green financing by identifying cutting edge uh, technologies to achieve operational efficiencies and rescale and or develop new products to uh, digitalize business models. Mm. Um, ADB is also focusing on making digital services gender responsive. Increasingly, we are also implementing pilot initiatives that support women's participation in the digital economy and gathering learnings and carrying out trials with digital solutions that have potential for scale. Uh, for example, ADB has been piloting digital technologies to support women's access to finance in Vietnam through non-collateral based lending, which uh, looks at other metrics including digital footprint. And while rolling this out with the partner bank, special hands-on training is also provided to women to build their skills and confidence in using the new app. And uh, combining high tech with low tech is often needed to ensure that women can fully benefit from new products and services and not left behind uh, uh, further. Uh, also in Indonesia, uh, ADP supported the Eastern Indonesia Financial Innovation Lab, or IFIL, and this IFIL project is facilitating partnerships between the regional development banks and the fintech sector to develop new digitalized processes and financial services to reach the MSMEs in eastern part of the country with particular focus on those owned by women. Um, and also in Indonesia, we recently concluded a supply chain digitization program uh, in collaboration with MasterCard and also a startup company called In France. And this aimed to digitize small family owned businesses called Warung, uh, which are mostly owned by women or run by women and provide an opportunity for alternative credit, uh, credit assessment to enable financial access. Um, in addition, ADB is also focusing on opening up opportunities for more women to work in the tech sector. Uh, for example, ADB is supporting She Loves Tech Startup Competition for Women and Technology. And in addition, promoting gender responsive policy environment is a very important area of our focus. Uh, for example, since 2013, ADB has been supporting the Indonesian government's ambitious uh, uh, vision and goals for financial inclusion through series of policy-based loans, uh, technical assistance focusing on access to finance, financial literacy, consumer protection, and financial technology and innovations. And this includes support for establishing a robust regulatory environment and strengthening institutional capacity to accelerate financial inclusion, including digital financial innovations, promoting collaborations with the fintech sector to expand financial services to MSMEs and the underserved um, segments such as women and youth, and also enhancing financial and digital financial literacy and consumer protection to promote responsible financial or digital financial inclusion. And ADP supported the development of Indonesia Digital Finance Innovation Roadmap and Action Plan, and also the first ever dedicated national women's financial inclusion strategy. 
and the strategy recognizes the importance of women's participation in the digital economy and the key priority areas of focus include financial and digital financial literacy, support for women on MSMEs, digital financial services for women, consumer protection, comprehensive support for women caregivers, and as the foundation for developing all policies, the collection of sex disaggregated data. Thanks, Julia. Thank you, Pornima. Very comprehensive overview of the so many different activities of ADB. Now let's immediately start the second round, also in the interest of time. Um, so let's try to be maybe a little bit concise for this second one. Um, and I would like to start with uh, Birame this time and ask you if you can tell us a little bit more what you think women can do at their own level to be change makers and impact their ecosystems. And also if you can cover briefly the kind of support that you think women in Africa need to continue to contribute to more inclusive economic growth. Over to you. Thank you, thank you. Um, gosh, what can women do to, <laughs> I think, um, to become change makers? I, I think the, it's more question of uh, women um, backing each other up. I think um, because we are not so many sometimes, especially in the digital space, being able to exchange and work together can only help us move forward. Um, you know, I personally, with my own company right now, uh, we just raised around a funding and in the process of, of hiring quite a bit um, without necessarily deciding to do that, I'm finding myself hiring mostly women. Um, because the recommendations that are coming to me are actually mostly women. The brands, the local brands that we support, 90% um, of them are women. They were all selected via competition that had men. So I think there's a, there's a natural shift that's already happening. Um, but I think as women, if when we are conscious about what's needed. We were just having that conversation not too long ago with a colleague of mine who was actually going on a panel to speak about a bit the same types of topics. And I suggested to her that maybe it's a, a question of, of um, being able to understand that yes, women are different from men in some, in the, in, in some, in a lot of aspects, actually, we are just different. Um, and, and, and therefore women, um, sometimes have some very specific needs within a system that was built around the way men operate. And taking that extra step to make it easier, to not even easier, but just to make it um, equitable in terms of the way the process works, the environment works in terms of the, the times that you go to work at, the, the times that you can take some time off to take care of the children, or the way as women we think, if we make that deliberate effort to shift the environment so that it's, 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 it's a bit more fair to women, um, I think we already will go a long way in allowing women to be more productive and to be able to contribute even more. I think um, as women continue to become more and more bold, uh, as women continue to become more and more vocal, we are doing, we are leaving a legacy for the next generation and, and, and becoming change makers of our, of our own, just all of us even sitting here today. Um, so I, I, I think it's just more, a question of us figuring out how to work together and understand what are the areas within the system that we can change uh, within the corporate environment or any other work work environment. Um, and you know what can be done in order to support women more. I, it's what we're doing. It, it's I think the 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 power you know having learned having studied and worked quite a bit in the United States, I always say the US is very, very, very good at marketing, meaning highlighting the things that work. Um, and if we're able to highlight the stories of women, not as in that's a woman, but just people just need to see it to know it. We don't have to position it as, oh, look, she did a great job for a woman. No, it's, this is just an entrepreneur or this is just a woman that's doing really, really well in her sector, and it just happened to be a woman. 
But that side, we, we, we don't always have to say it. I think our young um, girls see it on their own and will connect on their own. Because I think that the message sometimes is getting diluted as we continue to say, this is specifically for women, because right away people look at it, oh, it's just, she's just doing this because she's a woman. She's just raising the money because she's a woman. So, uh, you know, if we can maybe try to highlight what women are doing well without diluting the message by almost um, saying she did well as a woman. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> it totally makes sense. And this is why earlier today I introduced you as digital entrepreneurs and not yes. female digital entrepreneurs. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's continue the conversation um, with, uh, with Claudia now. Um, so you are part of the community of E-Trade for Women and the initiative that Viridiana uh, presented before. Uh, it is led by Anktad and the other partners of E-Trade for All. So how can this initiative unlock women's potential to take part in the digital economy and contribute to the recovery? Over to you. Thank you, Julia. I will share my experience, my personal experience. I joined e -Trail for Women last year, and it has been a great experience from the very beginning. It has been an experience of, of, full of learning. Being part of the e -Trail initiative gave us I think that give us the opportunity of an empower ourselves in the role of e trade has helped to understand that the future of digital business opportunity in the markets are important and be crucial for us now and in the future. Understanding that is important, and we have learned this in, in, in e trade initiative. Also, e trade shared with us key important information on how we can take advantages of these opportunities in the digital economy. This is something that we have learned in the past months and how we as community of entrepreneurs can also be an advocate for women between us. And at the same time, this contribute to the economy recovery because we own our business, our own businesses. And if we succeed and grow, we can give more jobs to more women. I think that e trade is a huge initiative that give us a platform outside of our local network that increase our capability of influence others about women empowerment. The session with advocates teach us how e-commerce provide us to the opportunity to grow our business in markets and audiences far beyond our geographical location. Our e-trade communities also give us a safe place to share our concern, our challenges, our fears, and learn from experienced business women from their mistakes and lessons learned. I think that to improve our business and companies, we need access to best practices that save us money and time in the run. And this is what E-Trade for Women has did us, this from the very first session. They constantly invite us to join global sessions and I participate in different sessions outside of my Latin American community. And that was a great opportunity to learn uh, from other advocates and peers from other parts of the world, share their experience and open my mind to award best practices and opportunity that otherwise I wouldn't imagine. In each session, we learn how digital economy could let us to be more successful in our businesses, encourage us to develop entrepreneurial skills and pursue greater accomplishment in our business together as a community. Finally, I can say that E-Trade gave us a network and also visibility and support as female leaders in the digital world. And this will deeply impact the present and future contribution of our businesses and the capabilities to impact an ecosystem of other female entrepreneurs. Thank you, Claudia. I would like now to go to Amy, also because she is the co-founder of something called SoutheastAsiaWomen.org. And I think I would like to ask her to give us a couple of more details about it and also to share with us briefly her thoughts about uh, what women in Southeast Asia need, what kind of support they need more. Uh, over to you, Amy. Well, thank you, Julia. So SoutheastAsiaWomen.org was really um, 
a project in response to sort of that idea that women are hard to find, women experts, women leaders, and across a variety of sectors. And we were actually inspired by that urban myth, and I think it's probably true of that Excel sheet that, that circulated around Silicon Valley of um, female software engineers available that won't be hard to find to hire. And so we thought, well, we have, um, a wealth of um, female experts. Uh, and I hesitate to just say women leaders because um, a lot of them are experts without the ability to take leadership roles. And um, so we decided to launch a platform that allows um, uh, anyone to get in touch with uh, these women who are profiled uh, to as, as speakers, collaborators, uh, mentors or mentees. And the point is we want to reduce that barrier between um, uh, visibility and access to women to ensure that there's there's um, a, lot, a lot of ease um, in terms of finding women across different sectors and also reaching out to them. And so this is something that we're doing voluntarily um, and um, hoping to expand with more women profiled every year. So we hope it's used as a resource uh, by anyone really, organizations who are looking for speakers, collaborators, um, southeastasiawomen.org. In terms of what women in Southeast Asia need, I feel that um, the biggest barrier to uh, women participating more um, beyond sort of the, the systemic um, policy, um, you know, support that, that we could have in terms of um, investment in women's education in STEM and uh, making sure that um, infrastructure and, and, and affordable access to internet is there, but really just um, education around the, the informal work that a lot of women are, are bearing the brunt of, especially during the pandemic, but definitely before. Um, for myself, I mean, I'm, I'm a very privileged, um, educated woman in, in a really rich country, and yet I am also still thinking, I think I probably should do a bit less work around the house because I need to spend a bit more time on my business. And so if someone like me has to really have that conversation and juggle that and have challenges around that, I can't even imagine what other women with, you know, strong, uh, more and more prohibitive um, social norms around being able to give up care work to do this um, are facing. And I feel that regardless of what infrastructure or policies you have in place, if these women still don't have the ability, time, effort, energy, freedom to, to even think about starting their own business, let alone really scaling it, then um, you're always going to have that limitation. And so it goes hand in hand. And I think this isn't unique to Southeast Asia, but um, we've, as we can see, policies are, are changing. and um, infrastructure is being improved upon. And so um, what other area is not being touched on? And I feel that is a part that hasn't really been addressed across all the different Southeast Asian countries. Um, there, there are a lot of you know, ASEAN economic community um, uh, plans in place across the region to try and really improve connectivity, but we're not addressing um, the social barriers for women to enter um, the, the economic um, uh, community. and. Um, I feel that regardless of what happens, if we don't address this and we don't actually bring this conversation to the fore and challenge some of the social norms that are, that are in place, not having any official or formal support or recognition of informal work, um, then you know, we're, we're always going to face limitations. Uh, and I, I feel this is probably equal across the world, but definitely, definitely prevalent here. Thank you very much, Amy. Very interesting, and I think a very good complement of what other speakers on the panel were, were mentioning. Now, uh, let's uh, conclude this second round with uh, Pur Purnima again, ADB. Uh, Viridiana was saying it at the beginning, so the COVID-19 pandemic has been a catalyst for the digital transformation, and so a spectacular acceleration of uh, the transition towards digital everywhere in the world. And this is something that, in a sense, uh, makes it even more urgent uh, to address the digital gender divide that uh, we are here to discuss today. So uh, what are the lessons that you can share with us, uh, Purnima, uh, given your experience at ADB? Uh, over to you. Thanks, Julia. Um, so uh, where ICT and digital technology are introduced to meet the needs of women and girls, um, they have a great potential for reducing gender gaps. Um, as we know, digital gender gaps are prevalent in Asia and the Pacific with significant gaps between women and men's use of the internet and also other technology. Uh, for example, women in South Asia are 26% less likely to own a mobile phone uh, than men and are 70% less likely to use a mobile 
internet. Hmm. Uh, the pandemic has seen a rapid acceleration in e-commerce and demand for online shopping. However, a recent study by the IFC indicates that in the Philippines and also in Indonesia, online sales revenues fell for women on businesses by 27% and 44% respectively during 2020. Um, so while e-commerce holds great potential for businesses, issues around affordability and also comfort in using digital technology still represents a significant gender challenge. And the advantages of technologies um, and e-commerce to survive the pandemic will remain elusive without significant investments in reducing such uh, gender gaps. Hmm. So from our perspective, some key lessons for building an inclusive uh, recovery could include uh, first setting targets in non-traditional sectors. So ADB project set gender targets across its operations irrespective of sector, and this ensures that women and girls can have equitable access to project benefits and to reduce gender gaps and opening new opportunities for women in non-traditional sectors, um, notably in STEM and ICT related sectors, has allowed not only uh, more women to enter these non-traditional sectors, but has led to a positive domino effect by shifting perceptions of uh, women. And uh, also as um, uh, mentioned by Amy, it's also important integrating social norm approaches across Asia Pacific um, region, women, including women entrepreneurs, have identified the significant increase in unpaid care work, notably childcare and homeschooling, um, as a factor affecting their ability to continue to work on their business performance. And 25% of women entrepreneurs surveyed by the firm We Connect in fourth quarter of 2020 identified that childcare as negatively impacting their businesses. Uh, in Asia and the Pacific, uh, like other global regions, childcare is still seen as the primary response responsibility of women and even before the pandemic started women were spending up to four times more time, uh, time on child care than men uh, than men so the pandemic is uh, actually exacerbating the already difficult struggle for women's uh, businesses to juggle running a business and also running a household and the data from recent surveys is also indicating that working online has only added to women's care burdens during the pandemic with less external support for child care available so integrating a social norm lens will be critical to understanding how investments in the digital economy can mitigate against these time burdens and constraints of women. And uh, we have also learned that in some countries that digital infrastructure remain immature and establishing and enabling digital infrastructure, for example, for the finance sector is essential for the post pandemic economic recovery and promoting financial inclusion for the underserved and unbanked, uh, such as women and MSMEs. And um, ADB can work to help our uh, member countries uh, in establishing a basic digital ID systems for onboarding the unbanked into the formal financial sector and also enabling healthy digital ecosystem for better and affordable financial services and leveraging cloud technology for rural banks and MSMEs to uh, deliver secure, robust and climate resilient uh, financial infrastructure. Um, um, actually, in general, digital exclusion is a challenge that we face not just for the gender, but also for persons with disabilities, the elderly and those with spatial disparities, especially in the rural areas. So this points back to the need for building and expanding the reach of digital infrastructure, such as uh, data connectivity. Uh, finally, um, as um, also mentioned earlier, digital literacy needs to be a key component in any digital technology related projects and ADB will continue to incorporate such digital literacy and capacity development programs, exploring alternative methods such as virtual reality uh, technology um, deemed to provide higher retention rates uh, versus traditional classroom style uh, delivery methods. Thanks, Julia. Thank you very much for, for me now also for touching upon other types of digital divides that are uh, obviously extremely important because there are issues, sometimes people call them intersectionality, you know, when you belong to underprivileged groups uh, and therefore for you things are even more complicated. But anyway, time flies. The conversation was so interesting and I think participants were too busy to listen to the panel uh, to uh, ask questions in the chat box. But now before closing, uh, I just would like to check with Viridiana whether she's anything else she wants to comment on, uh, uh, she's 
she knew her head. So all good. Last okay. chance. No, thanks a lot to, to all our panelists. I think we, we heard very good examples. And uh, I mean, I don't want to go over the key points, but maybe one, a couple of ideas that I really uh, found very relevant. Um, at some point, Giram said that we need to demystify the digital space for women. I think that's really good. Um, I think also that um, I really uh, found interesting the fact that governments are also paying more attention now. And this, I think, was a point by Amy. So it, it shows that we're going in the right direction. And then, of course, UNCTAD and Interact for Women, we, we stand ready to continue to, to working in this, in this uh, area and, and continue supporting more women entrepreneurs like, like yourself. Thank you, Diana. It has been a great pleasure to co-organize this session uh, with colleagues at UNCTAD. And I would like to thank once again uh, all our amazing panelists, Amy, Birami, Purnima, and Claudia, and all the participants who stayed with us un until the very end of this session, uh, and uh, the entire E-Trade for Women team, uh, Sabrina, Sonia, uh, and also my colleague, Lina, uh, who had to co-organize this session. Thank you very much, and uh, I think we can close it by now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>